So now that we've got that, we're recording. <laughs> so today's speaker, um, Dr. Michael Halasa, comes to us from MIT, where he's the class of 1958 career development professor in brain and cognitive sciences and an associate investigator at the McGovern Institute. He obtained his PhD in neuroscience from the University of Pennsylvania and his MD from the University of Jordan. Um, he then went on to complete a residency in psychiatry at MGH. Mike has won uh, really a, quite a large number of awards. I mean, it's really pretty impressive. Um, just some of the more, uh, I think, notable ones um, include the Daniel X. Friedman Award from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, which he won for um, exceptional, exceptional research in basic science. Um, he also won an Allen Institute Next Generation Leader Award from the Allen Institute for Brain Research. He is a Cavley Foundation Frontier Fellow and a Max Planck Fellow also. Um, just a brief comment about uh, Mike's research. Um, he's really at the, been a pioneer in looking at what the thalamus does, in particular its relationships and its involvement in the mechanisms of cognitive functioning, including attention and cognitive flexibility. Um, he's published heavily in this area and is really, I think, uh, like I said, a leader in this area. It's really um, led, his work has really led to some uh, really novel insights into what the thalamus does in terms of its cognitive functions. He's published extensively in, in science and nature, um, it seems he has a paper coming out in those journals every couple of months. It's really quite impressive. Um, and he's going to be talking to us today about his work in that area. So, Mike, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, thanks, Neil, uh, for this very, very generous introduction. Um, I am uh, really humbled and I'm excited to be here and uh, talk to everybody about uh, the work that we're doing in my lab. Um, and normally, I um, what I do is I um, sort of open it up for questions right away and we end up having a conversation, but um, this talk might be a little, I mean, it's a little bit harder to do over Zoom, so I acknowledge that. Um, but, you know, uh, I feel like if, if people really have questions along the way, please feel free to post them and I'll try to address them to the best of my ability. But the, the hope here, I'll share my screen. The hope here is to really just give you a sense of, is my screen shared? You see the PowerPoint? Cool. Okay. So yeah. So uh, uh, the hope here is that you know by the end of this talk you have um, some idea of, um, uh, of of our approach to understanding cognition, uh, what we mean by cognitive control. You know the ability to um, generate thoughts and action plans based on an internal model of the world. And, uh, you know, the fundamental question here is well, why is the brain built the way it is, right? Uh, why is the brain built as uh, this network of recurrent networks that we call the cortex that have these uh, central regulator that we call the thalamus? It's, there's not an obvious reason that we can understand right now. It's not that you have to make artificial neural networks look like that in order for them to, make, to do something useful. But the brain clearly has chosen or evolution has chosen this as the way the brain is wired and we're trying to understand why that is. And you know, uh, just to say a little bit more about this, uh, the major goal in our lab is to understand this fundamental property of how neural circuits uh, underlie our ability to make complex decisions um, and we use, we use uh, animals to make these um, inferences about the brain uh, because, you know, because of the combination of approaches that we have in animals allows us to build wiring diagrams of these basic control functions like attention, working memory, uh, task switching, et cetera. We, we, and, I, and I'll share some of that with you. Um, and then another sort of goal of the lab that stems out of this work in animals is, is our collaborations with, uh, with people in artificial intelligence and machine learning that is trying to um, you know, make uh, uh, artificial algorithms more brain-like, uh, in a way increasing their efficiency, et cetera. And then the final sort of leg of our research program is about trying to connect what we do with, um, with, uh, with human health. And uh, as Neil uh, uh, mentioned, I am a psychiatrist and uh, uh, his lab and mine 
are engaged in a collaboration that takes some of the work that we do in animals and asks how much of that can explain or can translate to understanding uh, decision making and cognition in schizophrenia. And I'll share with you one slide uh, at the end of the talk that summarizes that work. Okay. So um, before I start, I'll just sort of mention this. The talk is going to be mostly conceptual. I'm going to show um, mostly ideas and less data, uh, just so that you know uh, the ideas are accessible to the audience and we spend more time on these things than we would do normally on a data heavy type of presentation. But if anybody's interested in the data, just let me know and I can, I can explain more. Okay. So the particular cognitive process that we've focused on over the last few years has been the process of goal-directed attention. It's our ability to uh, 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 amplify and suppress incoming sensory signals based on internal goals or task rules, for example, if you're in a laboratory setting. So uh, we, we've learned quite a bit of how this process gets implemented uh, from studies in humans and non-human primates. You know, people like Bob Desimo and Earl Miller, for example, have done a lot of studies in monkeys to show that this process has two components, an executive component that we think is housed in front cortical circuits. And the reason why we think that is because when you look, when you examine the activity of these neurons in goal-directed attentional tasks, you see that their activity patterns reflect internal goals and task rules. And we think uh, that based on these signals, these signals can be projected back onto sensory uh, cortical areas. Now, this is a second component of goal-directed attention. And these internal signals can change the sensitivity of these areas to their incoming inputs. And that's how we can amplify the things that we care about and suppress the things that we don't. So uh, the contribution that my lab has had among many of our colleagues who study subcortical structures like the thalamus, this area, is to show the contribution of the thalamus to gold directed attention. And that again comes in two flavors. One is on the sensory end. So early work from the lab has shown that areas like the lateral geniculate and medial geniculate, for example, not passive relays of incoming inputs from the eye or hair, et cetera, but they are they have gating functions, they, their, their activity patterns are modulated by top-down input at, that, that comes from frontal circuits. And we've described a circuit that involves basal ganglia that translates those top-down inputs to changes in thalamic gain function. But what I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about today, and I think what Neil pointed out in the introduction, is the role of non-sensory associated thalamus tension and person cognition more generally. More recent work from the lab has focused on areas of the associative thalamus, like the medial dorsal thalamus, that gets most of its input, not from the periphery, but from the cortex itself, and projects back, not so much to relay any particular type of signal, but rather to configure cortical activity, these internal representation, according to the context at hand. And, you know, Neil has pioneered work in this area that suggests that these types of interactions are perturbed in schizophrenia. And I think the work that we're doing collaboratively in animals and humans is trying to give us answers as to why, what are the computational mechanisms for these perturbations and how do they explain symptoms in schizophrenia that involve things like beliefs, belief updating, aberrant beliefs, et cetera. And I hope that this will become obvious throughout my talk. So let me, let me just spend one slide on what the upshot of everything that I'm gonna tell you about is, and hopefully that'll set the stage for, for the rest of the individual sort of components of the talk. Okay, so the thalamus, unlike the cortex, is composed of excitatory neurons that are devoid of lateral connectivity, right? So, so neurons don't talk to each other in the cortex, in the thalamus in contrast to the cortex where neurons talk to each other a lot. So everything about thalamic function is specified by in long range input output connectivity patterns. So the LGN, 
gets driving input from the retina and projects with driving output to primary visual cortex. And responses in the LGN are very similar to those in the retina, they're center surround, they're just sensitive to, you know, change of luminance in small dots of visual space. And that suggests that the retina and the LGN are functionally equivalent, therefore the LGN is a relay. And the real interesting computation arises at the level of V1, which by learning the appropriate, you know, input weights from a bunch of LGN neurons can now construct these oriented edges or be sensitive to motion, et cetera. So the LGN is not doing anything particularly interesting computationally. And all the interesting stuff is happening in the cortex by learning the appropriate weights from LGN signals. Now, and that, that's the reason why we think that LGN is a relay. And that's been generalized across the entire literature to suggest that the entire thalamus is a relay. Now we think this idea is probably not right uh, because Areas like the MD thalamus are different both at the input and the output level. So at the input level, the MD gets convergent input from PFC, different types of input patterns. And we think that these weights are adjustable. So you can generate representations in the thalamus that don't even exist in the cortex. So that's a genuine thalamic computation. And even on the output side, those are not just simply relayed these end up becoming control signals. They can change excitation inhibition balance at the level of the cortex in ways that allow you to do operations that are quite different from what happens at the level of the recipient V1. What kinds of operations are those? Well, we think at least it, one of them is dynamic reconfiguration. So in an area like the PFC, where cognitive signals like task rules, for example, are generated by different types of input patterns. You can think of this as the meaning of words based on words from two very different languages. It helps to have, an, to have a, a structure like the thalamus that would rapidly compress a particular input pattern and then use it to amplify the context relevant input pattern, suppress the context irrelevant one so that the cognitive signals are configured according to the relevant input at hand. And that is something that is unique to these associative cognitive thalamic areas. That's what we think could be perturbed in psychiatric disorders, can, can explain the generation of inappropriate cognitive signals in various types of disease. Okay, so I'm going to give you, uh, uh, I'm gonna talk about three different components. Uh, most, almost everything we learned here so far has been done in genetically accessible animals like mice, although we're doing other model organisms now, and I can tell you about that. But, you know, I'll tell you about how we developed the goal-directed attention task in the mouse that allows us to understand, you know, these prefrontal substrates and how they switch according to changes in input patterns. Then I'm going to tell you about how we use this same preparation to understand how the thalamus plays this role in reconfiguration. And then I'm gonna show you, uh, you know, the, the mouse component of the collaboration that we have with Neil about decision-making under uncertainty and how we're translating that wor work across organisms. Okay, all right, doing fine on time. All right, so um, this is the task that we developed in mice uh, a number of years ago to capture the process of goal-directed attention. Now I'll explain it because it's really important. Understanding it is probably the most important technical detail of this entire talk. Okay. So this is a two alternative force choice task where an animal selects between a visual stimulus and an auditory stimulus on a trial by trial basis. The visual stimulus is a light flash that can appear to the right or the left. And the auditory stimulus is a sweep that tells the animal to go to the right or left. Now, oftentimes these things can be in conflict and I'm showing two configurations, but sometimes they're not. So it's pseudo randomized. And the animal has to figure out what the relevant stimulus in order to travel to it and receive a reward. Now, how does the animal know which of these two stimuli or two targets to allocate attention to? Well, we train it over several weeks to make the following association. We cue it on a trial by trial basis with one of these two arbitrary cues a low or a high pass white noise, and we've changed those things. So these the exact 
details of those uh, stimuli or cues are not that relevant. But we, on each trial, we give it one of these um, uh, two cues, which tells it the mapping, which of these two stimuli is the valid one. So the animal gets it, needs to maintain it over a working memory delay, keep it in mind over a delay, and then map it onto the appropriate stimuli. And we've done extensive experiments to ensure that the animals use a rule-based strategy, a high-level strategy to solve this task and not some low-level alternation that mice tend to engage in. And once we can do that in a mouse, it opens up a whole world of circuit dissection and the ability to ask questions that currently we cannot ask in non-human primates. For example, we can ask the question, is the PFC, is the mouse prefrontal cortex required for goal-directed attention in a way that we expect based on primate studies? And the answer is yes. And we can do it at a level of resolution that's unmatched. So optogenetic inactivation of the mouse prefrontal cortex, either during the cueing or the delay period of the task, renders mice incapable of appropriate selection. They basically guess. It's equivalent to not even giving them the cue in the first place. But optogenetic suppression of the PFC during the, the target presentation has no effect on performance. So this idea is consistent with this uh, top-down control of attention, but not the sensory selection process itself. To make a long story short, we think that the task is at a network level is a biased competition between vision and audition. It's a race between these two sensory pathways that the PFC arbitrates at the level of sensory thalamus. So when the animal attends to audition, the PFC suppresses visual transmission at the level of the geniculate. When the animal switches to vision, the following trial, for example, the animal suppresses the auditory pathway. And the way we know this is, because, is, is, is using recordings from these different areas. We see trial type modulation of spiking activity in the geniculate, for example, where we see higher spikes in attentive vision, lower spikes in attentive audition. And those spike rate changes are completely eliminated by suppressing the PFC on single trials. And I cannot overemphasize how valuable these perturbation studies are simultaneously with recordings to make these types of strong inferences about how the task is solved. We can also ask questions about how the PFC solves the task here by obtaining neural recordings. And again, I'm not showing the data, I'm just showing you the sort of cartoon summary of what we found. We think what happens is that the inputs, the cues of the task come in and they're maintained in the PFC through lateral connections. And interestingly, neurons that are sensitive to the same Q type are more likely to be connected to one another. So we think that the activity patterns that maintain the Q over that low working memory delay is set up by training the animal for several weeks. And that training allows these neurons to develop these uh, higher connectivity weights that allows the network to maintain the activity pattern over time. One question that arises from these studies is how abstract are these representations in the mouse prefrontal cortex? Is the mouse just remembering a cue association to another cue, or does the mouse abstract that cue to mean attend to vision and attend to audition in a cue invariant manner? I'll give you the intuition. If you're driving down and you're at a traffic intersection and you see a stop sign or a red traffic light, part of what we do is abstract these very different sensory signals into the instruction to stop. And that allows us to hit the stop brake. Uh, yeah, the, the, our brakes. Do mice have something similar in their brain that would abstract the way the sensory details of the cues and just store something abstract in their mind about attending to vision or attending to audition? It's a very important question because it tells us 
how seriously we should take the mouse as a model for cognition. So what we did is had the mice play this, this two alternative force choice task under different input config configuration conditions. So we trained animals to play the high pass, low pass game that I told you about, but we also trained them to play the same game, but with different colored lights. Now these cues are very different in terms of their you know, sensory features. This is the sound, this is the light. And we asked the question, are there you know, neural representations in the mouse brain that abstract away the cues and just give us the rules, attend to audition and attend to vision? And the answer is yes. There are neurons in the prefrontal cortex of the mouse that robustly encode these, uh, th these cues in a cue, th these rules in a cue invariant manner. So the way we think this works is that, you know, the inputs come in, there are input neurons that store these memories in the PFC, but there are readout neurons that are local to the PFC itself that can interpret these rules and then project them down onto sensory systems to control the gain at the level of sensory thalamus that I told you about. And we think that there's an entire hierarchy that's built through learning in the mouse brain where there are cue to rule transformation, and in this paper, in the 2019 paper, what we found is that the identity of these neurons, we found that these neurons are labeled lines that take these instructions, uh, sorry, and projects them down onto the sensory parts of the striatum, which translates that signal ultimately to gain control changes at the level of sensory thalamus. And we can do that in the mouse we can, we can, because we can do optogenetic tagging, for example, and look at the identity of these neurons and ensure that they are Q invariant. Okay, so just to summarize the first part of the talk, the mouse PFC can build hierarchical representation in a task relevant manner. Sensory selection for broad stimulus features can be performed at the level of sensory thalamus, and the striatum is involved in transmitting PFC output into sensory gain control that is relevant for attention. Okay, so let me tell you about the second part of my my talk, which is about how we discovered this process of thalamic reconfiguration of PFC representation. So we really fell into this uh, by serendipity almost. And, and um, you know, uh, the way this happened is we were simply asking the questions, how does the PFC uh, get these Q inputs that then ultimately abstracts and spits out as, uh, as rules? And uh, the first hypothesis was that, well, it's gotta be getting it from the thalamus because that's how V1 works. It gets it from the LGN, so where else could it be? So uh, this was completely wrong because when we optically suppress the MD thalamus during the queuing period, and, and this is a little bit nuanced, but, but you know, when the animal is performing the test just fine and you, you know, inactivate the MD uh, on single trials, there was minimal behavioral or physiological effects. So that told us is, well, it's not, it's not possible. If you inactivate the LGN, for example, when you're showing the sensory uh, visual stimulus, V1 is, doesn't know about that stimulus. So, so, so this is not working the same way as sensory systems, at least for this thalamic structure. Uh, but what was surprising is that when we inactivate the MD thalamus during the delay period, the PFC representation fell apart. So early encoding was just fine. The cues could interpretation was the cues can make it into the PFC just fine, but then the um, the the neural patterns of activity were not maintained if the uh, MD was inactivated. So something was dependent on long range interaction with the with the, with the with the thalamus for maintaining those activity patterns. That was that was really puzzling, and allowed us to then ask the question, well, what do MD neurons care about? What do they actually encode? And what we found out is that MD thalamus neither encodes the cues, nor, their, nor does it encode the, the rules. So we can encode the rules and the cues, I'm not showing it. The inputs and the outputs of the task are encoded just fine in the PFC. We can't read them out from the MD, but what we see in the MD are, is, is, is a task relevant variable that we call the temporal context. And it simply means which game the animal is playing. We can read that that task relevant variable um, 
very easily and very, much more robustly from the thalamus than we do in the cortex. So the cortex seems to be specialized for the inputs and outputs of the task, but the thalamus is encoding this other variable that has to do with what are the input patterns being played or what is the game that I'm currently playing. And this type of activity pattern in the MD is completely eliminated when we deafferentiate it, when we stop PFC input to it. So we interpreted all of this to mean is that we have these task relevant activity, you know, sort of patterns in the PFC or neurons that maintain the, uh, the Q specific uh, uh, memory traces, working memory traces over time that are selective to each of the cues, but that the MD does not care about the individual cues. It just cares about what the game is. So the, 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 to explain the responses of the MD, we hypothesize that they may be converging, may, there may be convergent input from the PFC and the information is lost. So this is a dimensionality reduction uh, that allows you to keep track of what game you're playing. And then in order to explain why the MD is required to maintain these activity patterns over time, we hypothesize well, it's got to be that the MD may be just projecting back to the PFC and increasing the excitability so that neurons can now talk to each other uh, better. That was the hypothesis. We found out that this is completely wrong. And the reason is because we, we just asked a simple question. If we increase the excitability of the MD when we use these stabilized step function options, they're ju basically just really sloppy channel redoption that allows you to um, depolarize the membrane potential but not control spike timing. And the reason why we did that is because we thought, well, maybe there's some, some temporal precision that we ultimately cared about and we didn't want to mess with it. So we just wanted to sort of you know, juice up the MD and then ask, you know, does the PFC uh, get more excitable? And when we do this, just to sort of give you some more of a backstory, We've done this in sensory systems. Other people have done this in sensory systems. You juice up the LGN, you get a lot of activity in V1. So, so, so our expectation was that, you know, that, that's, that's, that's what's going to happen. But what we found is totally counterintuitive, is that the neurons in the PFC that seem to increase their spike rates when we activated the MD were inhibitory neurons, fast spiking neurons. But neurons that were regular spiking or excitatory were suppressed. And this has been a very robust finding that we see preparation after preparation, generations of people in the lab have come and gone. And, and we, we see this, uh, uh, this finding uh, consistently that driving this associative thalamus actually suppresses the cortex overall, at least basic basal spike rate. But interestingly, despite this suppression of basal spike rates, all measures of functional connectivity or how, how, uh, what the causal influence of neurons on one another in the PFC goes up. So although they're spiking less, they're talking to each other more. So, so that, was, that was interesting. And, and you know, that was not just uh, you know, a neat optogenetic trick. I mean, it is a neat optogenetic trick, but, but, the, um, uh, but the task does that for us. So if we look at MD spike rates, for example, when the animal engages in the task or during the delay period of the task, they go up. This is compared to when the animal is hanging out in its home cage. Uh, fast spiking neurons in the cortex go up as well. Regular spiking neurons, just their spike rates, don't go up, but they talk to each other more in a manner that's commensurate with what happens in the MD and fast spiking neurons. And you know, just to sort of nail this point um, causally, we did this Bliss and Lomo type experiment. So. You know, rather than just relying on correlations, we wanted to ask, what does MD activation do to evoked responses in the PFC? If we activate one neuron and look at responses from another neuron, what happens to the size of these responses as a direct measure of uh, uh, functional connectivity? And this is an example neuron in the PFC. When we activate the MD, again, its basal spike rates don't seem to change in any meaningful way. Some neurons get suppressed, but I'm not showing that. This neuron responds to you know, this optical activation, which is 
you know, responding to one of its neighbors. And although this looks like nothing, right, its combination with this intercortical activation leads to amplification. And this is a consistent, robust finding that we see in this system. And that's the reason why we say the MD amplifies PFC connectivity. Now, this is very different from what we see in sensory systems. Activating the LGN, which is what I mentioned to you before, generates increased spike rates in V1. Uh, and combining it with intra V1 uh, activation does not give you amplification. So we don't think this is a general property of the thalamus. We think this is a property of the MD for sure, but maybe other um, associative thalamic nuclei. We, we just don't know. Okay. So this, this, this finding allowed us to update our model and basically say, okay, well, there are at least two different effects that the thalamus has on frontal cortex. One is that the, you know, the, 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 this functional amplification of lateral connectivity that, that allows the cortex to maintain traces of working memory. Um, and then uh, uh, the activation of fast spiking neurons and together, this network implements a form of balanced amplification. So when an input comes in, it's maintained over time, but also everything that's competitive is being suppressed. When the input switches, you maintain it, you suppress the competition. In, uh, in, 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 you know, in subsequent work to this original discovery, what, we, what, we, uh, what we've identified is that what we've concluded is that these two um, uh, functions for the MD thalamus is actually subsumed by two distinct MD cell types that can encode the task context. Both of them can encode the task context in slightly different ways. But um, what we now think happens is that these two cell types are genetically distinct. And I'll tell you about that in the next section. But just to uh, you know, finish this thought, we think that the, um, th th this thalamic function that seems to be specialized for cortical inhibition is important for cognitive flexibility and task switching as follows. So going back to this task where we have the animal do you know, two different games, play two different games, again, you can think of it as you know, uh, generating or, or, or understanding two different languages, this can, in a human, this could be much, much, much higher dimension than two. So you can have very, very high dimensional input patterns that need to be segregated or quickly learned in cortex. What we think happens is that the MD thalamus can maintain the relevant input pattern in cortex, and then its local decoding will be, will be, uh, will be enhanced. But that's because what you're doing is you're not only suppressing, you know, you know, inputs within a task, but also you're suppressing everything else that's not relevant and you're decreasing the competition at the level of the local decoder. When the input patterns or the relevance of the pattern switches, you switch this process, you suppress whatever else is irrelevant at that point, and then these input output connectivity patterns can be built up, you know, within a couple of trials or a little bit of time. Can we see evidence for that empirically? The answer is yes. This is mouse data. These are um, connectivity filters that we can get for modeling the neural data. Uh, this is actually recorded data. Uh, we, can, we can look at, you know, th these are measures of connectivity between neurons in the task. This is early in the training, in the, in the switch. This is a moment, this is the animal doing task one and then switching to task two. So these are the connections. These are these connections, the new connections, building up over the course of five to 10 trials. Um, when we, this is in the cortex, when we suppress the MD thalamus on an interleaved, uh, in an interleaved fashion, we make this process take longer. This is reflected in the behavior. When the animal is doing task one, we switch the input uh, patterns. It takes about five to 10 trials to switch. When we suppress the MD thalamus during the queuing period, task one, nothing happens. Uh, but the switching takes a hit. And we think it's because it's interfering in the, uh, the fidelity of the local decoding of this new task. So just to conclude, under certain conditions, the MD thalamus does not operate as a relay. The MD thalamus exerts two distinct functional effects on the PFC that appear to be subsumed by two functional MD types. 
MD-dependent PFC amplification is critical for task maintenance, and MD-dependent PFC suppression is critical for task switching. Um, let me see what time. Sorry. I think I have time. Okay, so I have, you know, I have um, just one more thing. So, I, I, okay, so I, I mentioned that these two cell types, the one that um, maintains the task uh, relevant input and the other that suppresses the task relevant one are genetically distinct. And I will tell you a little bit about that and then I'll transition to the last topic of, uh, of, uh, of the talk. Is, is that okay, Neil? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, all right. So this is work done by Argo Mukherjee and Norman Lam. They're two super talented postdocs in the lab who uh, basically uh, took a circuit approach to trying to understand this, this problem. And, and what they basically um, uh, conjectured is that um, the, the, the circuit mechanism for this amplification of recurrent connectivity pattern was mediated by disinhibitory neurons in the PFC. So this is a circuit mechanism where you know, the thalamus projects the VIP into neurons um, uh, that inhibits somatostatin into neurons. And then you know, the, the, the sort of these dendritic compartments in pyramidal neurons in the PFC open up. And then you know, that's a really elegant mechanism for neurons to be talking to each other more, although their spike rates don't change. So that's a mechanism to enhance functional connectivity without increasing excitability. And then the other was that there, there are neurons in the, in the MD thalamus that uh, basically project the PV positive into neurons. And that's how you control you know, sort of basic basal spike rates. And those two things are uncorrelated. So, so the first question was, OK, is this process of amplification that was described in previous work dependent on VIP internals? So, so these are two effects that you get from activating the MD thalamus: this amplification of uh, evoked responses and the suppression of baseline spike rates that I told you about before. Inhib inhibiting VIP neurons in the PFC eliminates this amplification response consistent with Argo and Norman's hypothesis, but Suppressing VIP interneurons has no effect on this baseline suppression. So that was pretty interesting. That told us that, okay, well, maybe this is, we're, we're, we're right about this. And that allowed us to hypothesize even further that, uh, uh, you know, the, the way these computational functions are implemented is through local circuit motifs, one targeting VIP interneuron, one targeting PV interneuron. So to test that more directly, uh, uh, Argo injected, um, you know, it started with, uh, with uh, a rabies tracing experiment in, uh, in frontal cortex and simply asked the question, if I start off from VIP and PV interneurons, what do I observe in MD thalamus? And what we found is that the projections from the thalamus are actually spatially distinct. VIP projecting into neurons were more lateral in the MD thalamus than the ones that to, to PV into neurons. And that was pretty unexpected. You know, we, we didn't really have any idea that this would be the case. But that ended up being a pretty strong constraint on subsequently screening cream mice to figure out, can we find genes that label these two populations independently. And you know, after several um, uh, failed attempts, uh, uh, Argo found these two different uh, Cree lines that map onto these two different functional projections. One that's positive for the dopamine D2 receptor that maps onto this amplifying VIP projecting population and one that's positive for this gene called RIC4, it's a, it's a kinase receptor uh, that have the same type of spatial segregation in the MD. They didn't just do that. They went on and asked if we activate the DRD2 population or the RIC4 population, can we recapitulate some of the functional effects that we've seen before? And what they found is a complete functional double dissociation, activating the DRD2 population causes an amplification, 
but has no effect on baseline spike rates. Whereas the Greek 4 population has no effect on amplification because of suppression of baseline, baseline spike rates. So these are two knobs that exist in the thalamus that have completely dissociable effects on PFC circuitry. One is to amplify signals and the other we think is to suppress noise. And you know, this is this is just showing you in the switching behavior versus the working memory delay, we also see double dissociation of these effects with these two different cell types. Okay. So just to conclude this part, two genetically distinct MD neurons enhance and suppress PFC activity patterns through local interneurons and MD cell types differentially contribute to maintenance and switching of task relevant prefrontal engagement. Okay, so I'll, I'll switch to the last part of this talk to tell you about something that's still ongoing. I appreciate everybody's feedback, um, but um, yeah. So, so this, is, this is really building on recent progress in, uh, in uh, studies of human decision-making and looking at the engagement of the medial dorsal thalamus in that, uh, uh, in, that, in that domain. And one thing that's consistent is that through very different types of uh, decision-making paradigms, the MD thalamus shows up as uh, to encode an uncertainty signal. So in decision-making where there's uncertainty about what is being categorized or how many uh, attributes one needs to pay attention to, uh, the MD thalamus seems to be engaged, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, more. Um, so, uh, so we 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 wanted to capture this process in mice, and in order to do that, we just simply uh, took the queuing period that we had before in the original test that I showed you, and parametrized it along the axis of uh, of uncertainty. So uh, instead of queuing the animal. Uh, by a single low pass or a high pass uh, cue, we gave it a sequence and asked it to integrate evidence for attending to vision or attending to audition. And we can parametrically control the uncertainty of this cue by increasing how, how much these two cues are mixed together on single try. So this, you know, if it's 50-50, it's impossible to solve. There's no right answer. If it's mostly one of the two cues, it's very clearly attend to vision and so on. And remarkably, mice can do this behavior lawfully. You increase the conflict or uncertainty, their behavior drops to chance level. And this, this behavior continues to be PFC dependent. When you suppress the PFC during the queuing period, the behavior is at chance regardless of the level of uncertainty. And PFC neurons shows, again, two different types of responses that are consistent with the input of the task what the cues are, and also what the rules are by integrating evidence in favor of attentive vision or attentive audition. So they show these classical integrator responses that you would expect uh, from previous studies of decision making. And you know, this is the this is the um, sort of uh, population decoding. Uh, you can see that uh, this is actually quite important um, uh, that the that PFC neurons as a population integrate evidence towards the appropriate attentional choice, attentive vision or attentive audition. But they do that in a manner that's um, uh, modulated by the level of uncertainty. So the higher the uncertainty is, the, uh, the slower the integration of evidence is. OK, what does the thalamus do in this uh, task? It's actually quite different from what the PFC does. Its engagement is proportional to the level of uncertainty encountered. If the uncertainty is low, you don't need the thalamus to do this task. If the uncertainty is higher, the thalamus is more and more engaged. Thalamic neurons show responses, again, that do not encode the inputs or outputs of the task, but the level of uncertainty. So this is another type of contextual variable that uh, it can be thought of as a summary statistic type of variable, which again would require you know, a circuit implementation that would involve convergence, because that's how you, the only way to figure out what the variance is, for example, is to sample from both populations. Okay, so um, I'm running out of time, so I'll summarize this very quickly. What we found is that neurons that um, you know respond to the conflict in the task or uncertainty, um, there's a subset of neurons in the in the MD thalamus that shows that. There are other neurons that seem to be um, modulated by the or increase their spike rate 
when there is uh, more, less uncertainty. Uh, fast spiking neurons in the PFC, inhibitory neurons, are similar to these conflict preferring cells. So what that allows us to hypothesize is that these must be the uh, GRIC4 cells that connect to fast spiking interneurons. When we suppress those neurons in the task, what we find is that uh, the, 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 the act, you know, they, they recapitulate this general MD phenotype, which makes sense. But when we suppress the D2 positive, the amplifying cells, we actually see a gain of function. So animals get better at the task when we suppress these D2 receptors, these D2 receptor containing neurons. This made us think that, well, okay, these weren't necessarily made to make the animals perform worse. It must be, there must be doing something else that we're not capturing with this task. I'll just skip this slide. I'll skip this. And I'll just tell you that what the upshot is. So what I showed you before was one type of uncertainty that's based on conflict. But uncertainty can also be, so the intuition is you go into a room, people are speaking multiple languages. It's going to take you quite a bit of time to decide what the language is being, what language is being spoken because there's a lot of conflict, right? That's one form of uncertainty. But there's also another form of uncertainty that has to do with people not saying anything. And it takes a little bit of time in order to gather enough evidence, but for a very different reason, which is sparseness. So what we hypothesized based on a bunch of modeling that we've done to the circuit and, and, and some, some other experiments that we were doing at the time is that maybe those D2 positive neurons are there to amplify the signals when the uncertainty is caused by sparseness, not conflict. And lo and behold, this was true. The MD as, in, as a whole was, was required for um, uh, doing this sparse task in, in a manner that, uh, that was proportional to the uncertainty. But now this is a different type of uncertainty. And that was completely carried by the D2 um, uh, component of the MD, not the, not the GRIG4. So just to summarize, input uncertainty resulting in summary statistic type encoding of thalamus generalizes to mice. The two cell types engage in distinct types of input uncertainty resolution. And thalamic specialization may tell us something more fundamental about how the frontal cortex categorizes different forms of input uncertainty. Now, you know, uncertainty in the world can come in many different forms. And maybe the reason why the brain is wired the way it is, is, is it's because of adaptation to the particular input statistics of the outside world and, and dealing with it in the most uh, efficient way possible. And I did have a couple of more slides. Um, I think I'm running out of time. So I'll just show you one slide that summarizes the collaboration that we have with, with, uh, with Neil's lab. And it really is capturing this, this particular thing. You know, this is, this, is, this is the effect of MD inactivation on decision-making under uncertainty. So this is a collaboration there it is, with, with Neil, that's spearheaded by, by Anna Huang in his, um, in his lab. And you know, they've done pioneering work on, on trying to understand the structural and functional integrity of this frontal thalamocortical system in humans and how it's perturbed in schizophrenia. So this is a collaboration, and this data is collected by Anna. Um, uh, you know, taking this uh, decision-making task under uncertainty, running it in human participants, and seeing effects that qualitatively resemble MD inactivation, uh, optogenetic MD inactivation in mice. So this is, this is, you know, to my mind, a really uh, good example of collaborations across organisms that's starting to potentially tell us something about why these uh, sort of perturbations may lead to, obviously, but uh, you know, with the advent of uh, um, you know, uh, ultrasound, non-invasive neuromodulation, we might ultimately be able to do something about these illnesses in a way that's informed by the basic science. So I'll just skip all of this. And hopefully what I showed you is that, you know, the thalamus is not a relay and that it has these multiple controllers that can be considered, you know, the functional backbone of how, you know, these large scale neural circuits can begin to interact with each other in a task relevant and a cognitively relevant manner. And this is, you know, this is our lab, 
uh, all of everything that I showed you was done by these amazing individuals that I am extremely fortunate to have, uh, you know, in my lab and in my life and share time with. Uh, they're here, uh, obviously our, our collaborators and uh, the support. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Mike. That was a wonderful talk. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to open it up to questions now if anyone has any. So let me look on the Q&A. We have a question here from Ariel. Um, Ariel asks, not aware of D2 receptor expression in, in MD of the mouse, although Chris Kellendonk has presented data on thalamic paraventricular nuclei D2 neurons. Are there data that confirm the D2 expression based on Cree mouse? Uh, the data that I'm showing? Yes, the, 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 the data that I'm showing are based on a Cree mouse, but we also have the uh, D2 virus from uh, Carl Dyseroth's lab. We've injected that and labels the same population. Does that answer the question? I will speak on Ariel's behalf and say yes. <laughs> Okay, all right. So uh, we have a question here from Stefan. What is the role of the sensory LGN or associative MD thalamus in the generation of visual hallucinations? Um, that's a great question. I, I don't know. Um, um, in a particular disorder or like Lewy body or... or uh... I don't know, but yeah, so just in general, I would say. Um, I would imagine that it would depend on the particular disorder, uh, what, the, what the engagement, uh, yeah. Um, uh, sorry, drug-induced yeah. delirium, for example. Oh, um, I, I don't know. I don't know what the data would be, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I only really so I brought up the uh, uh, the schizophrenia as uh, not not a, not at all from the perspective of hallucinations, but rather from the perspective of delusions, um, and and sort of uh, generating these these frontal plans that would be, you know, um, these neural signatures would be uh, the instantiation of beliefs. And then, you know, the, 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 the update process uh, would be dependent on, uh, on thalamic, uh, you know, long range thalamic interactions that would, would operate like a Kalman filter, for example, and update the beliefs according to, you know, changes in, uh, in input statistics. That, that's sort of my, yeah. Got it. Um, I think if we could unmute Stefan, he might be able to ask his question. There he is. Can you hear me? We can, yes. All right, very good. Mike, thank you very much for this uh, quite thought-provoking uh, talk. Let me clarify my question. Um, the uh, innovation of the LGN and MGN when it comes to neuromodulatory systems like acetylcholin uh -huh. varies quite a bit. Yeah. And so the question is, if anticholinergic delirium uh -huh. leads to visual but not auditory hallucinations, which is typically what we see clinically, how do we make sense of that at the level of modulating and filtering out sensory input from uh, the visual or the auditory system at the level of the thalamus leading to hallucinations? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, my, so I think Carmen Cavada had a paper in cerebral cortex maybe last week or something on uh, a, a cholinergic innervation of the pulvinar. Um, and uh, what I imagine, a lot of these visual hallucination phenomena may end up being is, is I, this is my intuition. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I don't have any data, but my intuition is that this would probably be more akin to um, uh, 
mental imagery rather than failure of, uh, of uh, filtering. And it would probably be something related to uh, just extra striate cortex, cortex disinhibition to some degree. And that might have a pulvinar component, but oh, this is all speculation. Thank you. Neil, you're muted. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, Anna asks, do you have any hypothesis about whether there might be different input profiles for the two MD neuron populations? Uh, so I think they do. I mean, we can start from both of these um, um, genetically defined populations and, um, and uh, what is it called? Uh, start, do rabies tracing. And I think Argo has done some of these already and they, they do have different inputs. They, they get inputs from different layers from prefrontal cortex and they have different uh, subcortical inputs. And to get back to this question of, uh, you know, is there evidence for D2 expression uh, in the mouse uh, based on uh, mRNA? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I haven't done any in situ myself, but um, what I do know is that uh, there is literature, human literature uh, on uh, PET imaging in the MD thalamus uh, with D2 ligand. So um, uh, yeah, the, the, the mRNA in situ stuff, I, I don't know if that's going to be the, the, uh, the, the arbiter of whether these things are there or not, because there's plenty of examples where you don't see the message, but if you do the knockout in a cell type specific way, you get phenotypes. So, I don't know how to reconcile these things. There's clearly D2 PET signal in the MD thalamus of monkeys and humans. All right, I think that brings us to one and we will go ahead and wrap up. Um, Jenny, is there any of the last comments that you have to make or anything? Um, oh, I had just uh, allowed Dr. Deutsch to speak, but I do know that it's late, so. Oh, okay, I oh, sorry, I mean, I didn't. If um, Aaron wants to go ahead and ask a question and follow yeah, up on sure. his question. Yeah. Here, there you go. Okay, this, this is a great talk, very, very thought provoking, but uh, on back on that D2, we actually reported on that D2 in the human MD. And in oh. the human MD, the D2 is shown by a pitopride binding for example, both in PET and in autoradiographic studies is present, but it's in the medial MD. It's not uh -huh. in the lateral. And uh -huh. it's most heavy in the paraventricular. Yeah. So the question is then, is the paraventricular, the medial, in some way different in its connectivity with MD? It's, it's a, it's a, it becomes of particular interest in schizophrenia because PVT has projections that collateralize to MD and the ventral striatum and the amygdala. Uh, are you saying that PVT is connected to the MD? No, no, I'm saying PVT to prefrontal. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Those neurons collateralize to also innervate the uh, ventral striatum and the amygdala. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know anything about, the, we have never done anything in the PVT ourselves. I mean, I know Mario Penzo and some other people have studied the D2 pathway in, in, uh, in, in rodents uh, from the PVT. Uh, all I can say is that, um, uh, how should I say it? Uh, uh, we don't have any mRNA data ourselves. And I think people have looked with, uh, you know, with single cell RNA-seq, for example, right. at the monkey thalamus. And they, there's not really a D2 signal there at all, including the PVT.
So I don't know that this is the, um, I don't know how to interpret these results because clearly, you know, your work and others show that the D2, uh, there's D2 signal in the PVT, there's Carmen Cavada's work in monkeys, although it's less direct. Um, so, uh, and, and definitely in, uh, in Cavada's work, the lateral uh, MD of the monkey is innervated. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I think we can wrap it up there in Ariel and um, you can follow up with Mike uh, later to hash this out. Um, <laughs> Thank you again, Mike, for a wonderful talk and thank you for presenting. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm sure they're, you're welcome to follow up with Mike. Please join me in giving him a quick round of applause. All right, thanks, thanks. everyone.